on the world stands up. Tim Minchin. Kathleen Madigan. Jason Manford. First, Ted Alexandra. You guys ever have somebody call you by the wrong name repeatedly? And for whatever reason, you never bother to correct them? <laughs> After a while, you start to kind of like it. <laughs> my next door neighbors knew me as Kevin for like eight years. I loved it until one day my mom slipped and told him my name was Ted. I was so annoyed. I was like, Mom, how could you do that? <laughs> you know I'm Kevin. And it was so embarrassing, the next time I saw my neighbors, they were like, why didn't you just tell us? <laughs> and I was like, you liked me as Kevin. <laughs> when I was Kevin, the world was alive and everything was brand new. <laughs> and I'm just afraid to lose all that now. They said, look, we liked you as Kevin, we'll like you as Todd. <laughs> I suppose you will. So I'm single, we just had Valentine's Day, which was nice. I like to think of Valentine's Day as kind of like girl Christmas. <laughs> because Christmas you receive gifts from an imaginary man who doesn't really exist. Just like Valentine's Day. <laughs> to me, being single is like a struggle between loneliness and euphoria. It's like loneliness right before you go to bed at night and euphoria the whole entire rest of the day. <laughs> really happy. Because marriage, man, that's too much commitment. I think marriage is basically just finding someone who you can tolerate. Just someone who you can put up with, which is why they use the word take in the marriage ceremony. It's like, can you take this one as your wife? <laughs> really, you can take this one? All right, you do what you want to do. But I'm getting irritated just looking at you. <laughs> Go right ahead. My friends are all getting married, which is kind of weird. You go over to their house, all of a sudden they're adults now. They've got like the married things in the house. Spare roll of toilet paper. <laughs> with a little knitted hat on it. <laughs> I used to live with two other guys. Like if we had that, somebody's wiping their ass with the hat at some point. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Somebody's flushing the hat. It looks nice, but it serves a purpose. It's functional. I'm still enjoying the single life. Went down to Mardi Gras a couple years ago. I was down there with a buddy of mine. He was another comedian. There were some girls up in a balcony. A chant goes up, show your tits. I joined the chant because I support the cause. <laughs> Starts off kind of fun and frivolous, like show your tits. Then it gets more like fucking show them. <laughs> the girls show them, we throw up some beads. I figure that's the end of the transaction. Turns out they reciprocate with a chant of their own, we want cock. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> Turns out I had some cock on me. <laughs> Drop my pants right there, beads showering down on me. Best moment of my entire life. Cut short, handcuffed, thrown against the wall. My friend runs off but manages to get a picture before he does. <laughs> I don't know a lot about prison, but I do know handcuffed with your pants down, covered in beads, is not a good way to arrive. <laughs> but it wound up being good training because about maybe six months after that, I got cast on Oz on HBO, which if you're not familiar with it, is like this kind of raw prison show that was on. And the way that I got cast was exciting because it was unexpected. I was doing a comedy show in New York City and unbeknownst to me, the producer of Oz happened to be there that night. So he called me up the next day, he said, I saw your show, I'd like to have you in for a meeting. So I was like, great. So I go to meet the guy, he's like, so are you willing to take it in the ass? I was like, right now? <laughs> He was like, no, on the show. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Close one. <laughs> but it made me think about the whole prison situation. Like, I think if a guy ever tried to rape me, I would immediately try to rape him back. <laughs> He'd be like, what the hell are you doing? I'm raping you. What are you fucking crazy? Get away from me. I'm raping you. What are you nuts? Get the hell off of me.
Finally, he'd get all fed up, like, you know, I don't even want to rape you anymore. <laughs> then word would get out on the cell that I was a difficult rape. He'd be like, yeah, he tries to rape you back. <laughs> really, can he do that? Yeah, he does it, he like follows you around. It's, it's really uncomfortable. I'm good at driving. I've not always been good at driving, though. A few months back, I was driving 80 miles an hour on a 50 road, really needed a wee. Right, desperate for a wee. You know when you're really bursting and weird thoughts go in your head like, well, I've got sponge seats. Right, but you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Do yourself a favour and don't, right? <laughs> and after, after a bit, I noticed an empty Coca-Cola bottle in the passenger footwell. I thought, hold on a minute. I've weed before, I've driven before. How hard can this be together, right? <laughs> it's hard, right? I was, I was weeing in this bottle, right? I thought, oh, shit. Uh, I didn't think shit, that's the worst thing to do. You don't want to... <laughs> You're gonna trick yourself at that speed. So I'm weeing in this bottle. I thought I was gonna wee too much, that was my fear. I thought, I'm gonna wee too much here. Right, I'm gonna wee too much. And then amazingly, 550 mil on the dot, it just stopped, right? <laughs> and I put the lid on, threw it out the window. And, um... <laughs> but what's, what's the worst, leaving it in the car? What do you want me to do, right? And I threw it out the window. And it's horrible, I know, right? But can you believe you failed me for it? That's out of order, can you believe that? That's out of order. <laughs> There's nothing in the theory test, and I've had a recheck as well. There's nothing there. <laughs> Do what you want. I failed that driving test six times, right? And uh, not for the same reason, but I failed it six times, and it's horrible failing your test. Who's failed the test? Yeah, yeah a few people. Six times? <laughs> Just me. <laughs> Just me. I need to lower this joke to four. <laughs> I. Uh... <laughs> No, I did if I failed loads, and it's horrible, right? Because in that test, they just add stuff that you never do again. You know what I mean? Like, can you parallel park between that blue car and that green car? Eh, uh, no, let's park there and walk, you lazy bastard, right? There's no... <laughs> I make it so difficult. You know? And in no sense of humour, I was going 35 in a 30 zone, the examiner said, what speed are you doing, Jason? I said, same speed as you. And that was a fail. <laughs> that was a fail. And when don't you do this? I got to a junction, I looked right, I went, all right, your side. And then that was a fail. That was a fail as well, so... Very picky, very picky, the old examiners. And I, uh, It makes you bitter, you know, it makes you bitter. Cos my girlfriend passed first time, and I thought, well, clearly, it's because she's a girl. And she's pretty. And she's obviously wore a low, you know, a short skirt and a low-cut top at some point and maybe had a bit of a flirt with him. Oh, is that the gay stick? Right, or something like that, right? <laughs> and even worse than that was when I did it, that was another fail, so... <laughs> it's a lose-lose situation. I, uh, my family are Irish, and I don't know if you know this, right, there's more Irish people in the rest of the world than there is in Ireland itself, right? That's an actual fact. You can find it on the internet. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Their biggest export is people, right? They love it. And uh, the tourist board in Ireland have taken this on board and they're thinking of changing their slogan to Ireland, we're not all there. I think it might work. <laughs> be all right, wouldn't it? Be all right. Yeah, can't go wrong with that. <laughs> But my, my, dad, my dad's Irish, he's, he's, he's narcoleptic as well, my dad. That is the funniest disease in the world, right? That's the sleeping one. It's, it's actually the second funniest. The funniest is Tourette's, obviously. But... <laughs> that, go, that goes without saying, doesn't it? But firstly, it's, it, secondly, it's, it's narcolepsy, right? And it is, there's no greater feeling as a kid than being called in when you know you're in trouble and your dad going, you, you're in... do me. When we were kids, me and my brother, what we'd do, we'd, he'd fall asleep on the couch and we'd go upstairs, get changed and pretend he'd missed a day. It was brilliant. <laughs> great fun. It was great fun. Oh, man. Has uh, <laughs> anybody ever nearly killed anyone? <laughs> OK, few people, few people. Anybody killed anyone? Anybody nearly been killed? Anybody been killed? Anyone there? Right, I, uh, I nearly killed my best fr friend once at university, right? I had a helium canister in my flat, right? Now, helium's great, isn't it? We're all a big fan of helium, aren't we? Woo, we got squeaky voices! <laughs> Let's ring for the pizza! Right, they love it. <laughs> Half past two in the morning, Domino's, you know, and they're cleaning up, just ring. Ah, oh, yeah, can I have a nine and a half inch Mexican, please? <laughs> right, and you get worried when he turns up, obviously, right? But we... <laughs> we, got, we got this canister. 
And uh, I was at university at the time, and my mate come round, he went, oh, let's have a go with helium, Jake, let's have a go with helium. And I said, all right, okay, you can have the one go, cos you don't want to waste it, do you, on knobheads, right? So he... <laughs> <laughs> putting it in balloons and sucking out of balloons, but he went straight for the pressurised canister, right? <laughs> but we were quite close, so I never told him, right? And he, he put his mouth on the nozzle, pressed the button, <laughs> and it blew up in his face, right? He flew right across the room, right? It was a student flat, he didn't fly far, right? And he's <laughs> in the bedroom there, next to the sink. That was always great. I loved being in halls of residence at university, and, uh, in there, and there was a sink in your bedroom. Always a big fan of getting up in the middle of the night going, look, oh, I'll just have a piss here. That'll... <laughs> I'll do. <laughs> Don't have a poo, though, that comes out your deposit. Right, so he's on the floor. <laughs> he's on the floor, right? And he's clutching his chest, and I felt bad, you know, he's clutching his chest, right, and he's, he's, he's struggling a little bit. I said, Stuart, you all right, mate? You all right? I'm panicking a bit. And he turned around, he went, I can't breathe, he's like this! Oh, I think I'm gonna die! <laughs> and he breathed like that for a week. It was brilliant. <laughs> Medics were laughing. It was a riot. <laughs> <laughs>I have four brothers total, which means I know more about sports than any woman ever needed to know. I am excited about I like to watch the Olympics, though. The biathlon, that's my favorite sport. I don't, because it's like where they snow ski for 20 miles and then they take a 22 rifle off their back and they shoot his stuff. Because I'm like, I don't understand how you lose this event. Let me get this straight. I'm in last place and I have a gun. <laughs> <laughs> At some point you have to pick the real target. That's all I'm saying. Hello, Mr. Sweden. <laughs> End of race. <laughs> I like the Summer Olympics a little better, though, I think, because I wanted to be a gymnast. That was my big lifelong goal. I was good, too. Of course, my parents did not encourage it or notice. My friend's like, well, why did they not notice? I'm like, there were seven kids in my family. My parents didn't notice anything. I could have been paralyzed from the waist down, and my dad would have been like, that's our lazy kid. <laughs> I stand her up right back on her ass. It's her mother's fault. She needs to get out and rake some leaves. That'd change this whole situation. <laughs> I'd rather have those parents, though, that didn't notice than the over-the-top pushy parents. You've seen them. It's always the ones on TV going, telling their one-year-old, you know, you can be whatever you want to be when you grow up. Don't say that, because it's bullshit. No, wait till the kid's about 10, and then you present them with a chalkboard and go, look, we've known you for about a decade, and here's what we think is realistic. <laughs> Fishmonger. <laughs> I did want to be a gymnast. I'm glad I didn't do it, though, because if you ever see those Olympic gymnasts, they never look properly developed. Their ages never match, their voices. They go to interview them. They're 18 years old, and they're like, I'm so glad to be here at the Olympics. I can hardly wait to start my period and eat a banana. <laughs> if I would have done it, I would have done the rhythmic gymnastics, because that looks like the girls that weren't really willing to try that hard. It's like they, they had a bunch of gymnasts, and they went, come here, girls. You're really sucking out there. So here's what we did. We went out of the store and we bought a box of crap. There's like a ball over there <laughs> and some toilet paper on a stick or whatever. <laughs> here's what you need to do. Pick one of these objects, take it out there with you, and when you get ready to do something hard, throw it as high as you possibly can. This will distract the judges from your shitty little car wheels. <laughs> The Olympics are ridiculous. There's so much cheating. How many skiers got kicked out? A ton. It's like all this steroid abuse. I say we quit using anyone that's actually prepared for the Olympics and start using us, the general public of every single country. It would be a lot more entertaining, be a lot better representation of how naturally athletic your people are. And it would be simple to do. It would work like jury duty. Like a month before the Olympics, we'd all receive a letter in the mail. And this <laughs> This letter would tell you as to what sport you've been randomly drawn to participate in. <laughs> you don't know how to play? You got a month. Rules are on the internet. Figure it out. Chop, chop. This country is counting on you. Do you know how much I'd pay to see my dad have to ice dance? <laughs> a million dollars. Just to hear the introduction. Coming up next for the United States of America, we have Jack Madigan. It says here he's going to be attempting to skate forward without having a heart attack. <laughs> And he'll be skating to the music from the movie Torah, Torah, Torah. <laughs> the only good goddamn movie made in the last 60 years. Quote. <laughs> they keep adding sports to the Olympics where you're like, really? I mean, you really want to feel smart about yourself this year? Watch the interviews with the snowboarders. 
Wow, I don't know if you've seen them, but it's like, is this the Special Olympics? Oh, or is this person real? Dude, I'm just so stoked to be in Italy. Uh, they do add sports, so where you're like, really? Like in the Summer Olympics, they've officially added the trampoline. I don't know. I just think of that more as a backyard activity. I mean, that's fine if we're gonna have that, but then I think we should also have hide and go seek. <laughs> we now go live to the hide and go seek arena. Bob, what's going on over there? Well, the Canadians have been missing for over eight and a half hours. <laughs> They're excellent hiders. The Germans don't seem to realize it's only a game. <laughs> And the Polish team is still, unfortunately, standing directly in the middle of the arena. A song about rock. He doesn't have a problem with drugs. He just doesn't do them. He's fine that his mates have tattoos, but he reckons they'll rue them. He likes going to pubs, but he hates it when the music's too loud. He tends not to go to rock concerts cause he can't stand the crowds. But all he's ever wanted to be is a rock star on Rage or MTV. But he knows that it's not fucking likely. He's just turned 30. He knows that he will always be a rock and roll nerd. Writing songs the world will never hear And though they won't be heard He'll just keep writing Oh yeah But you see the problem is He always dreamt of being a star But he learned piano instead of guitar Which in the 90s didn't get you very far So all the other kids were learning Stairway He was the piano to their forte convinced one day he'd rock their fucking asses and be an icon for the disenfranchised masses and grow his hair long and rebel against the state but just for now that would have to wait cause he's running late for his morning classes and he will always be a rock and roll nerd who keep playing gigs that no one knows about Though it sounds absurd, he'll just keep playing. Oh, yeah. But you see, the problem is there's not much depth in what he's singing. He's a victim of his upper middle class upbringing. So he can't write about the hood or bling bling. <laughs> so he sits and imagines his girlfriend is dead to try and invoke some angst in his middle class head. But she's always fine at half past nine when they go to bed And he's not spent a single night in prison He has no issues with nutrition He has no drinking problem and no drug addiction Unless you count the drugs they put in chicken <laughs> Marijuana always tends to make him cough he doesn't look good with his t-shirt off But when he tries to act tough You can tell he's tricking <laughs> While his mates all go out late a Popping pills and a having fun He goes home and showers and gets a good eight hours He gets his thrills from his morning run While his mates all go on dates a Taking speed and drinking cans of beam He stays home and cooks Curls up with a book with a girl he's had since he was 17 Cause he's never really been part of the scene While the other kids like Gunners, he like Queen He's more into Beatles than the Stones He's more a Stevie Wonder than Ramones And he's never owned a transit van He never shot a Sepultura van He doesn't know the difference between metal and thrash He couldn't tell you nothing about Axel and Slash He likes Ben Folds and the Jackson 5 He knows all the words to stand alive And though he wants to be all grungy and cool He spent 11 years at a private school so it don't matter Tries. He cannot hide behind his rock and roll eyes Cause you've either got it or you don't Yeah, you'll either rock it or you won't Yeah, you'll either got it or you don't Yeah, you either rock it or you won't <laughs> He 
knows that his music lacks depth. <laughs> but it just can't be helped. He has nothing interesting to say. So he writes about himself. But he doesn't want to seem self-obsessed, so he writes in third person. <laughs> in an attempt to seem more rock and roll. But he knows it's not working. <laughs> and deep in his heart, he knows he will never be Bono or Bowie. <laughs> and even if he was quite pretty, with small pants like Britney, <laughs> he knows that he will always be rock and roll man. <laughs> Could keep writing songs the world don't care about. And though they won't be heard, he'll just keep writing. Oh, yeah. You can criticize him, but he won't care. Because he wants to rock. Rock and roll nerd.